distance between a very good trader and a very bad trader is about 15 centimeters or six inches, which is about the length from ear to ear. There's no nexus between being right and making money. It's how much money you make when you're right. The moment you focus on money, it just slips through your fingers. At the end of the day, you look at your P&L and you go, Hey, what's up, YouTube traders? We have a special guest here. The guy on my left-hand side is over in Australia. He's doing this with us at 6.30 in the morning to be here with us, and it's 1.30 my time, so I'm so thrilled to have him. And this is Chris Tate from The Trading Game. And I'm going to let him go straight into introducing himself because I'm going to learn along with all of you guys. So, Chris, thank you so much for being on here with us. And tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be on this interview with Bearable Traders. Thanks for the intro, William, and thanks for the early morning. Let's start from the beginning. I'm often very, very proud to say that I don't have a degree in finance, banking, or economics. Uh, my background is actually as a research scientist. That's where I began. And I was fortunate enough to begin my trading career during the early part of the 1980s bull run. So I've been around forever. I'm a dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> And I, I moved from being a private trader into the industry per se. And I've done everything in the industry from sort of what you would call prop trading, funds management, been on the retail side, been on trading floors, and was fortunate enough to be able to retire in my early 30s. But retirement is a middle class concept. It's also really boring. Hmm. And as a result, I've continued to run my own family office but now run a company called Trading Game, along with my business partner, Louise, who reached out to you guys, where our aim is pretty, it's, our, our approaches are very, very much aligned in that our view is to try and get people to a point where they can trade any market over any time frame. but it's actually their system. They have a framework, they have an approach, we, we give them a skeleton. And so it's their job then to take that along with sort of our support network and actually run with it and do something much like you fellows do. Yeah, definitely. And I got one distinction for you, man. The dinosaurs, they ran the gamut, but they went extinct. If you're calling yourself a dinosaur and you did all this stuff and you're still in the game, more yeah, I'm, power I'm, to I'm, you, man. I'm slowly waiting for extinction because <laughs> some mornings I feel, feel my age. Um, yeah, well, so thank you so much for wanting to be on this. And when we were talking a little earlier, that's what we, we kind of discussed, that isn't it so interesting that you, you watched a video that we did with Mike Bellafiore, and then you saw a similarity in how we see the markets, which is somewhat different to how you see the markets and how Mike sees the markets, but really underneath it all, it's very mm. similar as well. Mm. And, and that's the thing. When, when I was looking at your, we would call it a market wrap and the way you build a picture of the market. If, if I stood back and looked at the way you saw the market and the things you spoke about, but you remove the time scale from your charts mm. where you build sequentially across much smaller, much fractal time scales than we do. I'd look at what you do and go, well, William's a trend trader, but he just sets a profit target. Hmm. And he's just a little bit more precise on entry. One of the things that is lost in all our discussions about trading is that people forget that the end aim of trading is simply to make money. And it doesn't matter how you do it. It, it doesn't matter whether you are scalper, short-term trader, option writer, trend follower, you're a positional block trader. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter because the end aim is to make money. The, the more people who trade, the more it helps everybody else. But it's that, it's that sort of success principle. My success is in no way hindered by you being successful. Like your success is in no way hindered by uh, Mike Bellafiore in his group being successful. Right. If anything, the fact that you've got running partners and people you can talk to is a brilliant thing. Yeah, I think we actually have synergies. I had a lot of people email me, text me, message me about what they learned from Mike Bellafiore and how it gave them another perspective 
to enhance their own trading. But we're going to get off topic for a sec because I really want to yes. ask you this from what you're Fine. saying because we never have talked, we've never have met, live in a different continent, you trade a different style. I'm wondering how, what your answer is to this because you're right. At the end of the day, at the end of every trading session, our goal is to make money. And even though every profession you're at, you know, whether you're a surgeon, a basketball player, yeah. at the end, you're, you're wanting to do that to make money, like in general. But in day trading, it's like the cash value at the end of the day is like staring you in front yeah. of your face. And that's different yes. in most con uh, professions. So the question is this, even though that is the, the end goal, we try to teach everyone that comes to us, don't think about it. The more you think about making money, the less you're going to make in the long term. It has yeah. to be the last thing you are worried about. You want to do smart trades. You want to focus on your psychology. You want to do all this other stuff, and then the money will follow. But as soon as you focus on trying to make the money, even though that's the ultimate end goal, chances are that's the path to failure. But yeah. what do you tell people? What is your perspective on that? Because maybe it's different. It, it's it's no, it's exactly the same. Mm. Because it is that again. We come back to that notion of commonalities the way we see the world is is similar because as we all know that the moment you focus on money it just slips through your fingers mm -hmm. and the, th the thing is one of process and so we we have a thing with traders where they'll often go through this thing they'll look at their p l and they'll go oh there's a there's a lot of red ink and you go well my response to that is is quite simple put another column in and that column is plus one, minus one. Mm. Plus one is, did you follow your plan? Yes or no. Minus one is you did not follow the plan. Sum that. And if that is positive at the bottom, then you have a mechanism that on average over time will make you money. And so it's remove, we, and what you say is true. It is so hard to remove people from this connection with money. Because they ought to, and I, I've done it in my early trading career, you probably did it as well, where you think, God damn it, that's 1500 bucks. I could have gone on a holiday with that. What mm. the hell? <laughs> or, you know, God, I've got rent due. Well, mm. oh, hell. And, and so you give it, you give it an emotional value. You give it a, yeah, yeah. You, you, you give it some context within your own life. I prefer to think in terms of plus one, minus one, or simply one hour loss, one hour loss, 10 hour gain, mm -hmm. bang, job done. And the results are normalized. But I think part of the problem is, and, and you, would, you would run into this being shorter term traders, is that people would approach you and go, William, make me wealthy. Tomorrow would be good. No, this afternoon's better for me. Tomorrow I'm busy. <laughs> And, and we have that. We, you know, I've had people approach me, and their view is that, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to watch the original version of Wall Street with Michael Douglas before he got old, set in the 80s. I'll start trading Monday, Friday. I'm going to buy a Porsche, and probably sometime next week I'll buy an island somewhere. And that's because they have this odd notion of how money works. But getting people to stop thinking about the money is exceptionally difficult, but it's always dragging them back to process, back to process. And I, I saw this in one of your young fellows videos, uh, is it Robert? He was going through what he'd learned over a year and he was looking at, he was showing his spreadsheets, his process, his system. And we do the same thing with people. We force them to have a process that I'm looking for this. It must occur here. If it hasn't occurred by then, I will go and have breakfast somewhere. And it's all, it's all process. But the point you make is very powerful in that at the end of the day, you look at your P&L and you go, bugger, <laughs> what, what, I've got nothing to show for the day. I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. If you were an airline pilot mm -hmm. and you ploughed the plane into the ground four times in a row in 30 minutes, they would go, look, mate, I don't think airline piloting is for you. But our business is completely different in that th there's no nexus between being right and making money. It's mm -hmm. how much money you make when you're right. And you don't let those catastrophic little losses catch you out. 
I mean, I, I view training as a business where you spend an awful lot of your time avoiding going broke, waiting for the trade that will make you the money for the day, the week, the month, the year. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's process, but it's so hard to get people to process. And I think it's, it's worse now than it was in the past. And it's worse now because if I, if I were to Google right now, Bitcoin trading, I would get millions of probably prepaid ads on Google mm -hmm. saying, I have a magic system. It's not the system, it's the individual. It's always the individual. And it's always the way they think. And it's always the process they use in the way they think. Okay. And th this, this is why when I watched your process, I, I, I actually put it up on the large monitor I have here and I just wandered back, sat on the couch behind me and went, can't see the time scale. This bloke does what I do. <laughs> and then I wander up and I see, oh, one, two, five. Oh, it's slightly different, but, it, but it's what I do because it's process. Mm -hmm. And all trading is process. Yeah. Okay. There's so many things that I won't be able to get into all of them. So I'm going to focus on one that'll help the most traders instead yes. of the questions that I really want to ask and say. So you gave, so traders who are watching this, he gave a specific idea how to overcome psychological issues of chasing money and focusing on money, which is have your spreadsheet, your journals, and instead of only using your P&L, use the plus one, minus one, and if you followed rules or didn't follow rules. All right. So Chris, since I've become on the back end of in the trading world and learned so much more and having so much more interaction with traders, their ups and downs and their stories, I try to share everything that I can with people since I'm at a place where I get to learn more and I share it. Yes. You've learned since you're a dinosaur, right? You've learned that's, that's so me. much more than I will ever learn. Hope, well, maybe not. Hopefully I'm in the game as long as you are. But for you, what's, a, what, what's another strategy that you use in your chat and with people you work with on how else can they overcome that, des not the desire, the human nature to relate the trading to the money and not being able to get away with it? You're, you got one yeah. idea with your plus and minus. Do you have anything else that people who are watching this can utilize in their trading? It, it's, it's really quite simple. Use stops. Because once you have a stop in the market, you know what the worst thing is that can happen to you. When, the, the worst thing that happens to traders, the thing that I, I notice causes them to freeze. People often talk that human emotion is divided into fight or flight. Mm. Well, kind of, yes. In the middle sits freeze, where people vapor lock and they just stop. They can't do anything. They're like a deer in the headlights. Freeze comes about, I think, because of uncertainty. They're uncertain as to what they're going to do. They don't know that when A happens, I will do B. When B happens, I will do C. When C happens, I will just leave completely because mm -hmm. I've got it wrong. And it is that notion of containing that uncertainty, of stopping that runaway of anxiety that catches people. And, and we've all had it when you're sitting there and you're watching the tape and you're going, it's red, <laughs> it's red, it's red. Why is it red? What the hell? And, and then you start to think, don't they know what I know? Surely they know, they know what I know. Surely I'm right and they're wrong. Mm. But then you think, I'm not quite certain how I convince everybody else that they're wrong. Uh, bugger, I've got it wrong, I've got to leave. But if you have certainty of outcome in some way, shape or form, that is you say, look, look I'm in for X. And if it drops X minus 10 points, I'm out, irrespective of what happens because the dealing system will throw me out. It's so much easier now because back in the day when I started, stops were all manual. You had to sit there mm. and watch the tape and go, I'm done. And you'd actually have to ring somebody up, which was a right pain in the backside. And right. by the time you've gone through, and if they're not at the desk, they've gone to lunch, they've gone to the pub, you're thinking, this is costing me coin. Can you get your ass back to the desk so I can get out, please? Right. But now, just the moment you enter an order, stop goes in automatically. You go, I'm good. I know what the worst thing is that can happen to me. And I think what happens to people is they blow their losses out of proportion as to what they are because they view them as 
a reflection of them. But what I get people to do is, is I write down, uh, I get them to write down a scale mm -hmm. of, and it's one to 10 and it's logarithmic, so it's a power scale. So two is not twice one, it's 10 times. And so 10 is the worst thing that could ever possibly happen to you. And people, when they do this exercise, generally write down death of a child or death of a spouse, something right. horrendous. And I go, okay, right now you've write down where losing five hundred dollars on a trade would come. One, if they're and being that's honest. That's generally one, right. if they're being honest. And I go, okay, write down where a parking ticket would be. One. Uh, yeah, I see what you're doing here, and and it's all about putting things into a perspective that is real as opposed to a perspective that is imagined right because, because i, I want to ask you what do you ever tell them what does it feel like when you have had that loss in the market your immediate reaction they probably say a 10 is what it feels like in the moment right yeah, yeah. and but then then we come and it's not in any way shape or form and then we come back to this thing of simply going okay we'll take a deep breath mm. look at your scale and go yeah, it's a one, isn't it? It's so, a one. So, <laughs> so, a one. so, so do you think? So, do you think you can you can trade again tomorrow? Yeah, I think I probably can. Whereas, if they if they held on to the fact that it was a ten, if that happened to them, a few trading periods in a row, their heads would pop off, mm. and they would not be able to go again. They'd look at, and this is the great tragedy, and you've you've no doubt seen this. Is you'll see people who have loss, loss, loss lock up and can't do anything next signal the system generates is an outsized winner right and they go and that and that just makes it so much worse for them and that increases their paralysis because they've missed that one that could have sort of uh, ablated all the losses there and thrown the PL into the positive but because they vapor locked after a series of losses because they couldn't contain or they couldn't measure what the losses meant truly, they just blew up. Well, you're the first person that's mentioned Robert um, outside of me if I don't mention him. <laughs> that's not part of our chat room. And he was, he is, was one of our best traders, not in terms of the technicals, but he brought the psychological aspect to our chat room. And he taught us, and he introduced the idea of the psychological and emotional currency is yes. far more significant than actual monetary currency. So what yeah. you just described, right, it's not the technicals that cause you to miss that amazing entry and trade, it's because you are psychologically and emotionally at zero. Your bank account for that is drained yeah. because yeah. of your past behavior. Yeah, you, you've, you've hit effectively what we would, you know, what we'd all call max drawdown in your emotional bank account. So there's nothing left in the system for you to get going with. And so you've got to find ways to, just as people, you know, husband their losses with a trading system, you've got to do the same thing emotionally because all of trading, and this is the thing that, that there's commonality among everyone I've spoken to. And it doesn't matter whether I've been speaking to hedge fund managers who manage vast sums or small little prop traders who are getting started. The thing that makes the difference is the way they think. And I, I often have this thing, when, when I used to do more lecturing to business schools, and I would say to them, we, we, I pose a little challenge, I'd say, look, right, and this is back in the day when here in Australia we had physical markets. We don't have physical markets anymore, they're all electronic. Mm. And I'd say, point, point to the market, and they'd all point vaguely in the direction of the CBD, Central Business District, and go, it's down there. And I go, no, you overpaid banking peanuts. It's not. It's here. Mm. It, it, it is between your ears, which means that the, the distance between a very good trader and a very bad trader is about 15 centimetres or six inches, which is about the length from ear to ear. And that's the thing with people. And you've no doubt seen this. And I, I saw this on dealing desks. The system I use now which is a breakout slash trend following system is the system I used 30 years ago. And I would sit beside people on our desk and they'd say, right, what do I need to do? And I'd say, you need to buy now. Oh no, but I think, 
I feel, I, I reckon. No, no, forget those things. Mm -hmm. Forget forget everything that your brain is telling you and just do what you're told. And people struggle to do that. And you, you've no doubt seen this with people where you would say, right, here is the skeleton methodology. The methodology works. I make it work. Everyone else makes it work. Why can't you make it work? And you can't make it work because of the person you are, because there's something in the way. Trading is really simple. If you compare it to any other high performance profession, compare it to being an airline pilot, compare it to being a surgeon, compare it to being an athlete. It, it's only got little rules. And the little rules are, as I, I said before, if it's going up, buy it. If it's going down, sell it. Don't bet the farm. You can't encapsulate neurosurgery into that. Mm. You couldn't rock up to a neurosurgeon and say, can you give me three rules that tells me everything about neurosurgery? <laughs> and you go, and they would go, rule one, probably don't go oops in the operating theatre because that, 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 that causes people to lose confidence in you. Mm. Outside of that, I'm thinking six years of med school, six years of postgraduate training, then another six years after that, you might have a handle on it. Mm -hmm. But and traders can't get over the fact that it is so simple. And, and I'm quite certain you could explain your methodology to someone in a condensed form in probably about an hour. And you go, okay, I'm looking at this. I'm looking for these little features. When I found, find those features, we call them an archetype. My stop goes there. I enter the trade and I, I go and get a coffee. And they go, y yeah, but, but I'm thinking, no, no, stop thinking. Don't think. Thinking's bad in trading. Doing is very good because trading is a verb. And once you have rules, anything you do will cause problems. You'll make it worse. You, there's no problem a trader can't make worse by interfering with it. It's a bit like being an astronaut. There's no problem an astronaut can't make worse. The, the central question for everybody is what, what is your edge? Your edge can be your time frame. Your edge can be your money management. Your, the edge for most people is their psychology. It's the way they think. It's the way they do things. If you, if you put a thousand very good traders in a room and get them to talk about trading, they talk about markets and systems for a little bit, and then they'd start to talk about the way they think and the way they respond to what their system is doing, the way they would respond to when things go wrong. And I, this, this, is, I, I, this is my point of slight, slight divergence because I was listening to your Brett Steenbarger interview and, and Brett's been on our podcast as well, Talking Trading. And I, I agree with him that you sit and you look at your good trades and they're to be celebrated. And that what you do is you go, well, what did I do well? What worked? Okay, I'm gonna take the, that modality that worked and I'm gonna use that as a framework and apply it everywhere. But I think there comes a time when you you'd need to sit down and look at trades that went wrong and went, okay, what happened? And more importantly, why did I do what I did? Why did I chase price? Why, why did I revenge trade? Why did I go back in when I'd had a small loss? What, what prompted me to do that, even though the system said not to? And I, I think you actually need to sit with these things and just mull them over in your head and just sit there and stare out the window and try and work out why you did that. Because once you work that out, the chances of you repeating it are, are really quite small. Now, well, <laughs> for me, I've repeated my bad behavior way too many times, even with in-depth thought. So I wish it was that easy. You can think it oh, through look, and not do it. That would be nice. Man. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's what this, this is, this is the, the problem with trading. Mm -hmm. A lot of it sounds so easy, but it's so hard. In theory, it's so easy, right? Uh, the rules are so simple. Buy here, risk here, mm -hmm. sell there. We're good. Repeat, rinse and repeat, 
rinse and repeat for the next 30 years, right. which is what I've been, which is what I've been doing after numerous years of just buggering it up and making the same mistakes as everybody else. But it sounds so easy, but it is a difficult profession. And this, this is why you need, and I, I'm assuming your group has them, you have accountability groups. We have an accountability group where traders sit down and say, guess what I did? Okay, what did you do? I did this. Okay, let, let's workshop and try and work out why you did that. Let, let's put the method aside for, for a moment and let, let's talk about what you were thinking, what you were feeling. Let, let's, let's try and work that out because it, it's, it's quite possible there might be a flaw in the methodology. People do have flawed methodologies. I, I've seen some outrageous ones. I was at a conference in Malaysia where I presented last year and some bloke got up and started talking about sunspots and we're all there going, I'm not certain I can make this work mm. because it's a nonsense method. It's just silly. Okay. And un unfortunately, you know, technical analysis, which we use as a broad church and there's all sorts of people on the fringe and there's us simple ones who just look at price and go, what's price doing? Because that'll tell me everything. All right, what am I doing? It's a, it's a little bit like uh, in my old training journals when I used to do uh, powerlifting, it, it would have the usual thing of, you know, date, time, weight, you know, sets, reps, any notes you wanted to make. But it had a really clever thing at the bottom. And the really clever thing was, how do you feel? Oh, I feel, I feel pretty ordinary, actually. That's why the day was ordinary. Why was the day ordinary? And so you had this sort of mental defrag. And I, I think that's missing from often trading journals. Trader, traders will write down, you know, I entered here, exited there, was clean. They'll have their market thoughts, a little bit of a wrap. But they don't sit down and go, how did I feel? No, I felt pretty poor, actually. You know, I, I didn't hit it right. I, my exit was slow. For some reason, I did not see, you know, overhead resistance and got caught. And I, I think you actually need that internal coaching. You actually need that defrag and refresh. And you sit with it for, you know, a little bit, and then you put it aside. It's, uh, there's a there's a mantra in sports coaching that some high performance coaches use and I've had coaches use it and they would say to you when, when you lose in a competition or you get something wrong you've got 24 hours to whinge whine mope about it and generally be a child 24 hours is over we're moving on and I think that's a powerful thing traders need firm blocks that says stops here. All right, today's a new day. p and blank, let's start again. But you've still got to go through the process of going, got it wrong, don't know why I got it wrong, got to think about why I got it wrong. And that, that's why I found Robert quite refreshing because he's a very honest young man. You, new young traders are not often honest with themselves. They're often full of excuses as to why, you know, something went down the toilet. That's, you know, somebody ran my stops, oh, broker was slow in executing, blah 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 and he was quite refreshingly honest in his approach and as a trader all you can do is be honest with yourself because the only person you lie to is yourself hmm. but no one else knows it's not like having a job where you know your boss catches you out you know fudging on your expenses or something you just lie to yourself oh my god so true on so many things you just said chris um I'm just going to say we actually don't have an accountability group in the way that you're talking about. We we promote this idea all the time. We talk about it. We share risk control ideas to be accountable. Yes. We share mechanical ideas. We have yeah. talks where we just do it kind of impromptu, but we don't have a specific set time of day or week or group yes. that meets to do that. And I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it would help the listener just as much as the person that's doing the talking it does and because my my business partner and i we we have regular defrags about everything we do mm -hmm. our mentoring group have regular defrags they they get together for coffee we run accountability projects within the program 
that force people to be accountable. Mm. And what we do is we start off with little things and say, right, uh, someone might want to get more out of their day. So they get an accountability partner and they say, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to get up at 6 instead of 6.30 and I'm going to go for a walk. Mm -hmm. And they're held accountable for that. They're, they're forced to be accountable and they're accountable to a group or to others. Uh, this is why sporting teams function so well. It's why uh, small group special forces teams function so well, because you're accountable to other people. And once you're accountable to other people, you're actually forced to follow through. You're actually forced to do your thing. So it's all right talking to yourself saying, oh yeah, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning a little bit earlier and I'll go for a walk. And then the alarm rings and you go, oh, it's cold. Oh, look, I'll go when I get home from work. Because the, the wonderful thing about humans is that the lies we tell ourselves are the most persuasive because we know ourselves the best. Mm -hmm. So we actually know what to tell ourselves. We know how to con ourselves. That's what I was going to say, con ourselves. Not tell ourselves, that, con that's ourselves. That's the word, con. Yep. And, that's the word. And we, we run this, and most people, and look, I won't say most because that's cruel. A lot of people run their life as one long con on themselves, whereby they're constantly pulling themselves back because they've got a, a rationalization, an excuse, some reason as to why they can or can't do something. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. It's bloody hard. Like, it's really, really, really hard. But the bottom line is, is doing anything well, as you would know, is really, really, really hard. You, you don't get to play. Let's pick one of your sports. You don't get to play basketball with the big boys by it being easy. Granted, you've got to be 12 and a half feet tall, but there's a lot of people who are 12 and a half feet tall who never make it. There are a lot of people playing in minor leagues all around the world. They're playing here in Australia, they're playing in Europe, they're playing in Asia. They never quite make it. So you have to be honest with yourself as to why these things might have occurred. Sometimes it's talent. A lot of the time it's application. Well, one of the other things that Robert introduced to our community with one other trader was the idea that trading is truly, it's like a window into ourself and it's a reflection of ourself. The difference is though, is that it manifests very instantly. So you can get away with conning yes. yourself for weeks, months, years and other parts of your life and you can finagle it, you can get away with it. No one knows and you can like shove it in the back of your head and not really, it doesn't materialize. Yeah, but in yeah. trading, oof, it materializes instantly with the market, man. Yeah, it does. It, it, yeah, tell him that's a very insightful thing, because you, you can't. You, you, the feedback is constant, and in, in part, this is part of the problem in that the feedback is constant. So you do have to deal with this. You know, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But, you know, and th this might occur in a 30-minute period. But he's quite correct. And it's very, very insightful that it is manifested and it's manifested so powerfully. And that, that's what disturbs and upsets and unbalances people is that the rest of life is not like that. If I have a normal job, I, I can make a screw up somewhere. I might better hide it, might better fudge it. I can, I can tell myself a lie, as you said, that, that, that takes months to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. But trading doesn't allow you that luxury because at the end of the day, week, month, you look at your P&L and go, <coughs> it's red, it's red, it's red. Why is it red? There has to be a reason it's red. And, and then we, we start off with that self-worth anxiety chain and uh, people trading just spirals out of control. So, yeah, Robert's a keeper. <laughs> Robert is a keeper. Uh, let me tell you one other kind of interesting story on the accountability partner that I've never shared. And so it's just a fun family story. But basically, and hopefully people won't judge my family and my uncle for this parenting technique, but he has <laughs> Every, two everyone, kids. Everyone's got, everyone's got one of those uncles. Uh, he's the best uncle ever. Best uncle ever. He's got two kids. They A, a male, uh, a boy and a girl. 
And they were getting into problems, and he decided that he told them this. I'm not going to use their names. I was almost going to use their names. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> if the next time you break a rule or do something you're not supposed to, I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to punish your sister. Ooh. Girl, the next time you do something you're not supposed to, I'm going to punish your brother. And they loved each other. They were very close. Yeah. And it took one time of one of the kids doing something wrong and uncle punishing the other person and then all problems were solved. So I know we can't do that with trading, but in terms of yeah. having accountability <laughs> is an amazing thing. And Chris, why do we need to be accountable to someone else versus ourselves? In theory, there's no one else in the world that we should be more accountable to ourselves than us. But for some mm -hmm. reason, I'm a hundred percent. That's not actually true. And I still yeah. don't and understand the psychology behind it. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm not completely on top of the psychology of what it is, mm. but it just seems to be that thing. And you see it in power couples. You see it in office marriages where you would think that two people together would merely be twice as good as one person, but they're not. It seems to be some odd little power law that they're, they're an order of magnitude beyond because there is something about the synergy of accountability that forces people. Let's take it back a step. Humans are a herd animal. We just are. One of the problems we have now with modern societies, we do none of the things we were meant to do. Humans were meant to eat together, dance together, sing together. We're tribal. We were meant to be around other people. We now live in a world of glorious isolation. We eat alone, we commute alone, we live alone. So, so we've lost that contact of mm. others. And so we're isolated, but we're and I, I do have some empathy for new traders with, particularly millennial traders with uh, social media, because there is this glorious narcissism that it, it, it sort of engenders in people. I am the most important individual on God's green earth. And they have an echo chamber that tells them that. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, the real world slaps them in the face and they don't have the resources to cope. But humans were meant to be around other people. They, they were just meant to be around other people. Uh, I, I've known family offices that manage upwards of $500 million, which is a substantial sum of money. Uh, they could split the family office and they could all work from home. The, the, the technology enables us to do that. You're in LA, I'm in Melbourne, we're chatting live in real time. Mm -hmm. you, couldn't, you couldn't do that years ago. Mm -hmm. I can trade any market in the world right now. I don't have to leave this seat but they find that when they're together, the performance improves. It, it just gets better because they bounce off one another. They're accountable to one another. Somebody goes, why'd you do that? Yeah, not certain why I did that. Okay, let's talk about why you did it. Don't do it again. Okay, won't do it again. And the, the, the hedge, <coughs> hedge funds could split themselves up. You don't all need to be sitting in an office in New York City. You could be somewhere else mm -hmm. and but there is something about being together and we we have this we have a saying in australia it's probably it's probably a universal one that a champion team will defeat always defeat a team of champions because a champion team works as a single unit they're all accountable to one another a team of champions they're accountable to themselves and only themselves mm -hmm. And this is the problem with trading. You are accountable, yes, to yourself first and foremost. But we are great deceivers of ourselves. We deceive ourselves. We tell ourselves lies. We, we, we hide the truth from ourselves because we're actually very good at that. Uh, we've had an entire lifetime to work out how to do that. And so having someone there sitting beside you going, what would you do that for? I wouldn't have done that. It's not in the rules. Why did you do that? It's stupid. Uh, all, all of a sudden, your mistakes become manifest and they're dragged out into the light. And often, it ta often you don't realise they're a mistake. Often you're so caught up in the way you think, the way you do things, that it's not seen as a mistake. It's, you, you see it as part of your natural behaviour. Tra traders do the same thing. and They, they build a rationalisation 
they say, yes, look, I'm something along the lines of, I know I didn't hit my exit, but I, I had these reasons. I saw this. I felt that. I'd heard this. You know, I saw something occur on the tape as opposed to, well, it hit my stop. I'm out. I, there is nothing else to do. So we, we're so good at lying to ourselves because we've had so much practice. Our whole life. That would be it. That would be it. <laughs> well, on that note, this is a great place to end it. We lie to ourselves our whole life, and that's one of the significant reasons why trading is so hard, because there's no hiding that part. It will manifest itself. And one thing you said that was interesting to add on to the idea that I presented from Robert is that why does it manifest itself so so significantly? Because maybe in our other li part of our life, it happens every couple days or weeks, and it slowly builds up. In trading, it can happen four times in a minute, and you have no yeah. idea what just happened. No, and I, I think that lying is such lying ourselves to ourselves is such a practice skill that when we see it occur in a different dimension, mm. we don't actually see it because it, it's so much part of our daily routine, and that's just the way we are. Well, I'm going to, and I, I do this, everyone does this, so I'll just admit, I definitely lie to myself and I can already Im picture in my head how I do it on a regular basis, so this will be the moment at least I put emphasis. Don't know if I can yes. solve it instantly, I know I can't solve it instantly, but at least yeah. I can put real emphasis and a plan around if I want to improve my trading even more and take it to the next level, how can I do that? Well, one thing is completely outside of trading stop lying to myself in as many ways as I can and that sure as heck gonna influence my trading. Would you agree? Mm. I would. You, you need that rigorous and brutal honesty mm. that, that some, sometimes you actually end up hurting yourself because you discover things about yourself where you just go, God, how long have they been doing that for? For years. That's a, dis <laughs> that's a disaster. Um, but it, it's, um, success is painful. Mm. It just is. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time. Can I have your... Um, uh, will you like to talk again, hopefully, in the future? Absolutely. Awesome. I would love to. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been brilliant. <laughs>